Hello everyone. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Data Structures. This is Chaitali Patil. I'm working as a professor from last 13 years in KK Bhag Institute of Engineering, Education and Research, Nasik. In this course, I'm going to cover few basics of data structures and all the linear data structures. Data structure is broadly categorized into linear data structure and non-linear data structure. In this course, I'm going to cover all the linear data structures such as stack, queue, array, linked list. This course is useful for all the computer engineering students, computer science students, and all those who want to learn programming and want to become a software develop developer. So I hope all of you will enjoy the course, all of you will learn all the concepts and remember to share your feedback, comment, suggestion at the end of the course. Thank you. Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to cover some fundamental concepts of data structures. So let's start. We know that a computer is a hardware. If we want a desired output from a computer, then we need to give program and data as an input to the computer. Program is nothing but a set of instructions which perform some operation on, the, on some data. So data that some input must be given to the program. This data is stored in a computer in some manner. The data should be stored in a computer in such a way that it can be accessed efficiently and this is nothing but a data structure. So in computer science, the study of data, its representation and its processing is very important. The success of any software depends on the representation of a data and the selection of the algorithm. The term data structures refers to the organization of data element and interrelationship among them. Now, why the data structure is important? If we have selected data structures properly, then the implementation of some operations may become easier. The speed of program may dramatically, dramatically increase. Memory efficiency or the use of memory may increase and the debugging may become easier. Now we will see some terminologies. ADT, it is the abbreviation of abstract data type. It is a mathematical description of an object with set of operations on the object. Algorithm. It is a high level language independent description of step-by-step -step process. Data structure, a specific family of algorithm for implementing an abstract data type. The implementation of data structure that may depend on the specific programming language. Data. Data is nothing but a piece of information. It can be broadly categorized into atomic data and composite data. Atomic data, it is a data that we can, that can be, that cannot be decomposed. For example, integer number, which we cannot decompose into a single separate digit. Composite data, composite data that can be broken down into number of subfields with some meaning. Each subfield may have some meaning. For example, a mobile number or a phone number. First few digits in a phone number represents the area code. So phone number is a composite data. Data type. Data type refers to the kind of data a variable may store. A data type can be a built-in data type or it can be a user-defined data type. In general, programming languages have their own built-in data types. For example, int, float, character, these are the basic data types in C and C++. User-defined data type, 
user can define his or her own data types. It is called as a user defined data type. For example, structure, union, classes. This is one simple example of a class student for storing the information of one student. A data, data can be stored like roll number, student name, and student percentage. And the operation that can be performed on these data are get record, it means get the information of a student, print record, print the information of a student, and search record, search the information of a student. So class is the example of user-defined data type. Data object. A data object is a runtime instance. Data objects represent a container for a data values. A place where a data values may be stored and later retrieved. Data structure. A data structure refers to a data and representation of a data object within a program. That is the implementation of structured relationship. A data structure is a collection of automy and composite data types into a set of defined relationship. In other words, data structure is a data organization, management and storage format that enables efficient access and modification. A data structure can be represented by using a set of DFA, where D stands for a domain, F stands for the function, and A stands for the axioms. Domain gives the range of the values that the data may have. Function is the set of operations for that data. An axiom is nothing but the rules which we, which, uh, with which the different operations belonging to function f can actually be implemented. This is the one example of DFA for integer. Domain D is integer or boolean set of function these are the different functions that can be on that can be applied on integer and this is the set of axioms now abstract data type edit is the mathematical model that includes data with various operations defined implementation details of a edit are hidden which is why it is called as abstract to represent the math mathematical model underlying an entity, we use data structure, which is a collection of variables and data types interrelated in different ways. In entity, our focus is on hide the operation. Our focus is on only on the logical properties of the data. It means what operation can be, what operations can be implemented that we refer, but how that operations will be implemented that is hidden. And that's why it is the abstract. For example, if we want to write an ADT for a queue. So our focus will be on which are the different operations that we can perform on an ADT. But ADT can be implemented by using an array, linked list, or by file. But this information will be hidden. This is one ADT for the integer. C++, C++ provides a class declaration. This class declaration is nothing but the ADT because it stores the data and we mention which are the different operations that can be implemented on that data. That's why the C++ class is nothing but a ADT. So I hope you have understood the basic concepts like what is data structure, ADT, and some of the terminologies like algorithm, data object, etc. Thank you. Hello students, 
In this video, we are going to study different types of data structures. A data structure according to different property can be categorized into primitive or non-primitive data structure, linear and non-linear data structure, static and dynamic data structure, persistent and ephemeral data structure. And last one is sequential access or direct access data structure. Now, let's see each one in detail. First one is primitive data structure. Primitive data structures are the predefined types of the data that are supported in the programming language. These are the fundamental data types of the language. For example, int, float, char, and pointer, etc. Non-primitive data structures Non-primitive data structures are created with the help of the primitive data structure. The non-primitive data structures are more complicated than primitive data structure, but they are highly useful. The non-primitive data types are the types that are defined by the programmer. They are further classified as linear and non-linear data types. See, the primitive data structures, these are the language dependent data structures, for example, integer, float, character, etc. Non-primitive data structures, array, list, files. Again, the list can be classified into a linear list or a non-linear list. Then stack, queue, graph, trees are the different examples of list. But all these are the non-primitive data structures. Linear data structure. A linear data structure is said to be linear if its elements form a sequence or a linear list. In linear data structure, every data element has a unique successor and predecessor. The example of linear data structures are array, stack, queue, and linked list. This is the linear data structure. Each element has unique successor and predecessor. Why a non-linear data structure? It is not. It is not in a linear list. A non-linear data structure. Every data element may have more than one predecessor as well as successor. Elements do not form any particular linear sequence. The example of linear data structure is tree and graph. Here we can see the data element may have more than one predecessor and a successor. Next data type is static data structure. In static data structure, the size of a structure is fixed. The content of data structure can be modified but without changing the memory space allocated to it. The example of static data structure is array. Once we have declared the array with some specific size, we cannot increase the size of that data for of that array at runtime. Dynamic data structure. Dynamic data structure. In the dynamic data structure, the size can be randomly randomly updated during the runtime, which may be considered efficient with respect to memory complexity of the code. The dynamic data structures are flexible. As per our requirement, we can insert more elements in a data structure. And if we do not need that element, then we may uh, delete or free that space for that data element. The example of dynamic data structure is linked list. Next is persistent and ephemeral data structure. A persistent data structure is a data structure that always preserves the previous version of itself when it is modified. Whereas ephemeral data structure gives us only the latest modified data only. For example, consider this data. Suppose this tree is updated afterwards and suppose we have added one more element to this node F. In ephemeral data, it will give the latest modified 
copy only but this previous copy of data it will not give but in persistent data structure it will give the previous data copy as well as the latest modified version of data also many languages supports this persistent data structure sequential access and direct access sequential access must begin at the beginning and access each element in a order one after the other whereas the direct access or the random access allows to access data element directly at particular that location by specifying its number by specifying its index number or the address this first mm, diagram shows the sequential access the access or we should start the accessing the element from the first location and one after another we can access all the elements but direct random access or direct access by specifying any particular this location we can access that number it means in direct access it is not necessarily to access its previous all the records so thank you everyone I hope all of you have understood all the different types of data structures. Thank you. Welcome back student. Up till now we have seen what is data structure, different types of data structure, ADT and some basic concepts of data structure. In this video, I am going to cover array. Suppose if we want to store the marks of one student then we can declare one simple variable for that student but consider if we want to store the marks of 100 students then what is the solution one solution is that we can declare 100 variable but it is not the convenient way so it is better to store 100 student marks in one array Array is a sequential and linear data structure. In sequential or sequential organi uh, organization allow storing a data at fixed distance apart. If the ith element is stored at location x, then the next sequential ith plus one element is stored at location x plus c, where c is the constant. If we intend to store a group of data together in a sequential manner in computer's memory, then array can be one of the possible data structure. An array is a finite order collection of homogeneous data elements, which, allow, uh, which also provides direct or random access to any of its element. An array as a data structure is defined as a set of pair, index, and value, such that with each index as index, a value is associated. Index indicates the location of an element in an array. Value indicates the actual value of that array. How to declare the array? The syntax for declaring the array is data type, array name, and the size of array. The size, it means how many elements that we want to store in that array. For example, int arr is the array name, and suppose we want to store the 12 elements, then this is the syntax. Int is the uh, integer data type for storing integer elements. This syntax is this syntax is allowed in C, C++, and in Java language. Look at this figure. This figure is for this array. Suppose one integer, for storing a one integer element, it takes a suppose four bytes, then for storing a 12 elements, a block of 12 into four, that is, 48 elements will be allocated in a memory. The first address where the first element will be stored and its first address is called as a base address. 
consider this is the array arr of 12 elements and the first address of this first element is 200 so 200 is the base address of this array the next element will be stored at 200 plus 4 that is 204 location the next element will be stored at 200 plus 4 that is 208 elements why plus plus 4 here we have considered that for storing a one integer array it takes a 4 byte so likewise all the elements will be stored in a memory contiguously we have seen that array is accessed by using the index position or index location array is to, array is a pair of index and a value so 0 1 2 up to 11 is the array index it is also called as subscript mostly in many languages the array index starts with the zero that's why even though we have declared the uh, 12 we have to store 12 elements of the array but the array index will start from 0 and 0 up to 11. Array in array, the sequential access as well as direct or random access is allowed. For example, we can access randomly any element in the array by using its index. Suppose array of 6 arr of 6 will print the value 19 arr of 0 will print the value 11 likewise by using the index position we can access any element in an array so array provides the random access sequential access from the first element up to last or any position that we want we can print the sequential values in an array as for each element in an array, there is only one unique successor and unique predecessor. So array is also a linear data structure. What are the different characteristics of array? An array is a finite order collection of homogeneous data elements. In an array, successive elements of a list are stored at a fixed distance apart Array is defined as a set of pairs, index, and value. Array allows random access to any element. In array, insertion and deletion of an element in between position requires data movement. Array provides static allocation, which means the space allocation done once during the compile time, which cannot be changed at runtime. What are the different advantages of array? Array permits efficient random access in a constant time big O of one. Arrays are most appropriate for storing a fixed amount of data and also for high frequency of data retrievals as data can be accessed directly. Wherever there is a direct mapping between the elements and their positions, Array are the most suitable data structures. Ordered lists such as polynomials are most efficiently handled using array. Arrays are useful to form the basis for several more complex data structures such as heap and hash table. It can also be used to represent string, stack, queues. What are the disadvantages of array? Arrays provide static memory management. Hence, during execution, execution, the size can neither be grown or nor shrink. Once we have declared the size of array, that much memory block for that, that many elements will be declared. So we cannot add more elements at runtime in an array. And if we mm, don't use the complete capacity of the array, then there is a vestige of memory. Array is inefficient when often data is to inserted or deleted as insertion and deletion and of an element in array needs a lot of data movement. 
Hence, array is inefficient for the applications which very often need insert and delete operation in between. So I hope student, you might have understood the basic concept of array. Thank you. Hello student. In previous video, we have seen what is array. In this video, I'm going to cover multidimensional array and string. Two-dimensional arrays. A two-dimensional array consists of both rows and columns of element. General declaration syntax include data type, array name, number of rows and number of columns in that two-dimensional array. For example, consider if we want to store a matrix of size 3 by 3, then the syntax is int, suppose we want to store integer data, then int matrix 3 by 3. This syntax is allowed in language C, C++ and in Java. Individual elements of the array can be accessed by specifying the name of array and elements row and column indices. Arrays can be initialized during their declaration. For example, see int matrix 3 by 3 is equal to opening curly bracket, then first three elements, comma, then in another curly bracket, another three elements, and in last curly bracket, last three elements. The compiler fills the array row by row. It means the elements are stored in the memory in the same order. For example, see, this three by three matrix can be stored by using such, uh, such diagram, see the diagram, row number zero, one, two. So 98, 87 and 92 will be stored in first row. Next, 89, 79, 85, 19 will be stored in row number one and last three numbers will be stored in row number two. Generally, most of the languages stores or most of the languages have the starts the array index with zero. As the size is three by three, so there are row number zero, one, two. Similarly, as there are three columns, so column number starts with zero up to two. How to access particular location in this matrix or in two dimensional array? We can access it by a row number and column number. For example, see this zero by zero, x of zero by zero, it means the element at the element at location zero row and zeroth column. Suppose the 98 here will be stored, 98 will be stored at row zero and column zero. 87 will be stored at row zero and column one. 92 will be stored at row zero and column two. Likewise, all the elements will be stored. Now consider if this last two in this matrix is stored here at row two and column two. And if we want to access this number randomly, then by using the array name and by uh, mentioning the row value and column value, we can access this number. So matrix of two by two will give you this value. So likewise, we can access the array element directly. Even sequentially also, we can access all the elements in the array. String. Strings are a fundamental concept, but they are not a built-in data types in C and C++. In C language, a string is a character array terminated by first null character. In C++, there are several classes available for string. Standard template classes are also available in C++. Suppose we want to declare the string by using a character array, then this is an example. Char for character array, str, so suppose it is a string, and 10. 10 is the size of this string. So maximum up to 10 characters we can store in this character 
array that is string str. String consists of contiguous sequence of characters terminated by and including the first null character. This is the null character. A pointer to a string points to its initial character. The length of a string is the number of bytes preceding the null character. The value of a string is the sequence of all the values of the contained characters in order. Consider this example. Hello is declared. Suppose hello is one string character and at the end it will be terminated by this null character. There are various string functions available in string dot h header file for example string copy string concatenate to count the length of a string for different operation there are many different inbuilt functions available in string dot h according to the application we can use particular string function so i hope all of you have understood the basic concept of string and two-dimensional array. Thank you. Welcome back student. In this video, we are going to study another linear data structure that is linked list. We have seen array as a linear data structure. Array is a static data structure. Maximum size of array should be known before the compilation process. Practically, defining such static size before the compilation of a program reduces effective space utilization. Accurate prediction about data structure size are very difficult. In array, insertion and deletion of elements in between required a lot of data movement. So all these are the limitations of static data structures. The linked list is a solution to overcome all these problems. Linked list is a dynamic data structure. A linked list, use, link list uses dynamic memory management on the following principle. Allocate and use memory when you need it and release or free the memory when you are done. So the advantages of linked list are it is very effective and efficient dynamic data structure for linear list. Items may be added or deleted from it at any position more easily at runtime, and it enables the programmer to make effective use of memory. Linked list do not necessarily contain consecutive memory location. Linked list is a linear data structure. It has a unique successor and unique predecessor, but it can be stored, the node can be stored anywhere in the memory and all these nodes are linked one after another. That's why the name is linked list. To maintain a specific sequence of these data items, we need to maintain link with a successor. A linked list is an ordered collection of data in which each element, that is node, contain a minimum two values or two fields, data field and a link or a next field which points to its successor. So there are two minimum fields in each node, a data field, data field can be of any type and a next field or a next pointer which stores the address of the next node. That's how, that's how it maintains or it creates the linked list. The last node in the linked list stores the null address. These are the few examples of the linked list. See, the first linked list, 
member one and the second field will store the address of member two. Similarly, member two here, first field will be the data field for this member two and it will store the address, second field will store the address of its node, next element. Likewise, the list will continue and the last node, first field will be our data field and as there is no any successor node for the last node, so the next field will have the value null. So null indicates this is the last node of the linked list. See the another example of the linked list, it stores the week dates information and the last node is Sunday and the second field of the Sunday is null. Linked list, there are few, some terminologies. We will see that first is a header node. A header node is a special node that is attached at the beginning of the linked list. This header node may contain special information. It is called as a metadata. This data stores the information about the linked list. A data node, a list contain data nodes that store the data members or the links to its predecessor or a successor. Head pointer, a variable or a handle which represents the list. This simply a pointer to the node at the head of a list. The head pointer always points the first node of the linked list. This head pointer is very important to traverse the complete list or to perform any operation on the list. Because of that head pointer only, we can access any node in the linked list. Tail pointer. Similar to head pointer, there is a tail pointer. A pointer pointing to the last node of a linked list is called tail pointer. So this diagram, here is the first node. First node is a head node. This node stores the information of the complete linked list. So this stores the metadata of the linked list. The first field is having the value three. It is showing there are three nodes in the linked list. Then this is the head pointer. Head pointer always points the first node. As this header node is the first node, so head pointer is pointing to the header node. Then all these second and third node and last node, all these are the data nodes. These nodes are storing the data inside the node and this is a tail pointer. A tail pointer points the last node. Now we will see the types of linked list. The linked list can be classified broadly in singly linked list and doubly linked list. This first diagram shows the singly linked list. In a singly linked list, each node, the next pointer stores the address of the next node. So as there is only one pointer which is pointing to the next node, so this is a singly linked list. There are few limitations of singly linked list. For example, once we reach, say, suppose the last node, and if we want to access the previous nodes of it, then it is not possible to traverse in reverse direction. And to overcome this, there is another linked list that is a doubly linked list. In doubly linked list, in a node, there are minimum three fields, a data field, a next pointer which points to the next node and previous field which points to the previous node of that linked list. So as there are two links, two pointer, next pointer and previous pointer in each node, this linked list is called as a doubly linked list. 
the last node in the last node the next field points to the null and the first node the previous field points to the null the advantage of doubly linked list is that it is bidirectional it means from any node we can access to its successor list and it is also possible to traverse the node in a reverse direction as well. For example, once we reach a node 99, then, or a 45, then we can access its previous link by using a, this previous pointer. The another classification of link list is based on the mode of traversal. It is a linear link list or a circular link list. Previous two types we have seen that is single link list and double link list is a type of linear link list. Now we are going to study circular link list. The disadvantage of linear link list in both single link list and double link list is that once we reach to the last node, then it is difficult to reach to the first node. In singly linked list, it is not at all possible to get the first node once we reach the last node. In doubly linked list, we can reach from the last node or from the tail node, we can reach to the first node, but for that we have to traverse all the in-between nodes. So to overcome this, there is a circular linked list. In a circular link list, the last node field points instead of null to the address of the first node. For example, see this first link list, this is a single circular link list. The last node is Sunday. Instead of pointing the next field as a null, it is pointing to the first node. So advantage is that from the last node, we can access the first node very easily. Similarly, in doubly circular link list, the last node, the tail node, the next field point to the first node. As there are two fields in the doubly circular link list, the previous field of the first node points or it stores the address of the last node. So in any direction, we can access the linked list from 56, 28, 92, 94, and from the 94, we can access the first node 56 easily, or from a 56, we can access the last node 94, its previous node 92, likewise. That's why, the name is circular link list. So we have studied what is link list and what are the different types of link list. Now we will revise the features of linked organization. In linked organization, elements can be placed anywhere in a memory. For example, see, this is the simple simple one example of a linked list, which we, we have already seen. These nodes can be placed anywhere in a memory. In an array, we have to place, uh, we have, or the compiler allocates a contiguous memory block for that array. But this is not the case with linked list. Any block can be stored anywhere in a memory and from the next pointer, we can access its successor node. So elements can be placed anywhere in a memory. Dynamic allocation, that is the space allocation as per the need can be done during the execution or a runtime. If we want to allocate a node, if we want to store more information during a runtime, then we can store it by creating a node at runtime. But this is not the case with the static data structure that is array and object are not placed in consecutive location at fixed distance apart. Random access to element is not possible. 
So random access is not possible in a linked list. Insertion and deletion of object do not require any data shifting as it is required in static data structure. It is space efficient for large object with frequent insertion and deletions. Each element in general is a collection of data and a link. At least one link field must be present in a node. Every element keeps the address of its successor element in a link field. The only burden is that we need additional space for the link field for each element. However, additional space is not a Severe penalty with large object are to be stored. Linked organization need the use of pointers and dynamic memory allocation. So this is how we store the linked list. So in this video, we have seen few terminologies of the linked list, the types of linked list and the advantages and disadvantages of the linked list. I hope all of you have understood this. Thank you. Welcome back student. Now in this video, we are going to study stack. Stack is an ordered group of homogeneous items of element. Elements are added to and removed from the one end only and that end is the top of the stack. We have many times seen the stack of plates, the stack of coin, the stack of boxes, stack of chairs, stack of shirts, etc. All these are the real life examples of the stack. Now consider the example say suppose this the stack of shirt. Initially, there is no any shirt present. Once we have put one shirt, when, once we have kept one shirt, after that, if we want to keep another shirt, then we will keep it on the top of the first shirt. If we want to add one more shirt, then we'll put it at the top of the shirt. Likewise, we can keep the shirts on the top of the previous stack. If we want to take the shirt, then from the top only we can take the shirt. So if we want the uh, second last inserted shirt, then we have to take out the first shirt first and then we can take the second shirt. So the insertion and the deletion in a stack is possible only through one end and that is the top of the stack. The last element to be added is the first removed from the list. That's why the stack is called as a last in first out data structure LIFO or the first out last in data structure FILO. So the definition of a stack is a stack is a linear data structure where the insertion and deletion is possible through only a one end and that end is called as a top. Now we will see the operations that can be implemented on a stack. Before that we have to declare the stack with some max item. It is the, this max is nothing but the maximum size or the maximum number of elements that we can insert in a stack. Remember, all these elements are the homogeneous elements. It means the data type of all the elements which we are inserting in a stack must be a same. And the item type, that is the data type. So what we need, we, while declaring a stack or while creating a stack, we need this information which data type, which is the item which we are going to insert in a stack and the maximum capacity of the stack. So the operations that which we can perform on a stack is a 
make empty or create a stack or a declare a stack then is empty this operation checks whether the stack is empty or not is full this operation checks whether the stack is full or not so the return type of is empty and is full is either 0 or 1 next operation is push operation we have to specify which item we are going to insert in a stack and this operation is called as a push operation another operation is the pop operation pop operation returns the item from a stack so it removes the item from a stack and that's why it returns the item so this is a stack insertion of a element is through this top of the stack and we can delete the topmost element only from a stack the insert operation we call it push and delete operation we call it as a pop while inserting the element while inserting the first element we check whether the stack is empty or not and while inserting any element in a stack we always check whether stack is full or not stack is full once it occupies the maximum number of elements whatever size we have mentioned up to that if the elements are inserted in a stack then stack is full push operation see look at this diagram the stack is empty initially the first element will be inserted in a stack from a top the second element will be inserted on the top of the first element the third element will be inserted on the top of the second element so precondition for a push function is that stack need to be initialized and stack should not be a full and the post condition of push operation the new item will get inserted in a stack similarly pop function once we have inserted the element at any moment we may require that element so for using that element we have to pop the element so here this 3 is popped from a stack 3 is taken out from a stack but always the topmost element can only be removed from a stack if we want to take out the one from a stack for that we need to take out 3 and 2 also from a stack stack overflow and stack underflow stack overflow is the condition resulting if we are trying to push the element into a stack even though a stack is full and stack underflow is the condition resulting when we are trying to pop the element from a stack even though a stack is empty so stack overflow we, for, for the stack overflow condition we can call this its full stack condition if the stack is not full we have to check it by use, calling that function if the stack is not full then only push the element in a stack similarly for stack underflow if the stack is not empty then only pop the element from a stack and for this we can call is empty function which check whether the stack is empty or not implementation of a stack there are two ways that we can implement a stack first by using a array we can implement a stack by using a array and another by using a linked list if we are if we have implemented a stack by using a array it means it is a static stack the size of stack we need to mention 
at the beginning. If we have implemented a stack by using a linked list, as linked list is a dynamic data structure, so implementation of a stack by using a linked list, it will give you a dynamic memory allocation. So implementing a linked list by using a stack is efficient if we see the memory utilization. Now we will see the applications of a stack. A stack data structure is used in wide range of application. Converting the infix expression into a postfix expression and prefix expression, we can use a stack. Evaluating a postfix expression, also we can use a stack. All the compilers use the postfix expression for solving the expression and for converting this infix expression to a postfix or evaluating a postfix expression, the stack can be used. Checking a well form or nested, nested parenthesis, the C, C++, Java code, all this code have the parenthesis used. Each code block we use opening and closing parenthesis. So whether a code is in a proper well form or whether all the nested parentheses are there or not, that can be checked by using a stack. To reverse a string, we can use a stack. Processing of the function calls, processing of the nested function calls or recursive function calls, a stack can be used. Parsing. Parsing. For a parsing, a stack can be used. Simulation of the recursion is another application of a stack. In compilation, for in computation, for example, converting a decimal number to a binary or hexadecimal number to a binary or a decimal or in any conversion, a stack can be used. And a stack is used in backtracking algorithm. So there are many applications of the stack. So I hope you have understood the basic concept of a stack. Thank you. Hello students. In this video, we are going to study another linear data structure that is Q. This is the last video of the course. In this video, we are going to see a Q operations, the operations that we can perform on a Q, then Q as a ADT, and we are going to see the implementation of Q by using an array. In real life situation, in real life, we have many times seen the Q for different things, right? So Q is an ordered group of homogeneous items or element. Similar to the stack, Q is one ordered data structure. But here in a Q, there are two ends. The element can be added from one end and that end is we call as a rare end. And always the element can be removed from the other end and that end is a front end. Look at this picture. This is one queue. Whenever a new person enters in a queue, he or she can enter from the rare end only. And whenever the person will get the service that will be removed from the queue from the front end only. So this thing we have to remember in a queue, there are two ends. The element can be added always from a rear end and element is removed from a queue from the front end. As the first person entered in a list will be removed first. That's why Q is called as a FIFO data structure. First in, 
first out. The first person will get the service first. So any example um, or a line at a supermarket or a queue in a bank, all these are the real life examples of the queue. Operations that we can perform on a queue are create a queue, it means declare a queue and initially initialize that queue as empty queue. Add the element i in a queue. So element can be added from a rare end in a queue and this will return a new queue with newly added element. Next operation is a delete queue. Take out an element from a front end and this function will return a modified queue. Get front. This function returns the front element, the element at the front position in the queue. Is empty queue. This function checks whether the queue is empty or not. Similar to array, a queue can be implemented by using two ways, by using array and by using a linked list. Array implementation of a queue is a static data structure, while linked list implementation of a queue is a dynamic data structure. Now we will see the realization or the implementation of a queue by using an array. So create function first, create function is create, create function creates the empty queue and it initializes few pointers. For example, suppose there are five elements in the queue, then we have to declare the queue with size five. And if we are going to insert all the integer elements in the queue, then we have to declare the data type of a queue as integer. Front and rare can be initialized to the minus one. So this is how we create the queue by using array. The next operation is is full. When the rear pointer points to the last location of the array, it indicates that the queue is full. That is, there is no space to accommodate any more members. So if rare is equal to is equal to max minus one, where max is the size of Q. If the rare is equal to max minus my, max minus one, it means that the Q is full. Else there is a space to insert the element in a queue. Add function, add operation. We always insert the element in a queue from a rare end. If the queue is not full, then we can add an element in a queue. So that can be checked by calling is full function in a queue. If queue is full, they can, then we can throw appropriate message like the queue is full. Otherwise, otherwise increment a rare pointer first because we have initialized a rare pointer to a minus one and in array, array index starts from a zero. So while inserting the element in a queue, always increment the rare pointer first and then insert the element at that position. So the first, while inserting the first element, this rare pointer will become a zero and then at the queue of zero, we can insert the element. See the operation add element. Rare pointer is incremented, rare pointer is zero. And now we have inserted the element at queue of zero. Similarly, consider one more operation, add 12. Again, increment a rare pointer. So rare pointer will become a one and at Q of one, insert the element 12. Delete operation. Delete operation can be performed from a front end. 
So delete operation, we always increment a front pointer. But before that, we have to check whether the queue is empty or not. If the queue is empty, then give an appropriate message that queue is empty and the element cannot be deleted. Otherwise, increment a front pointer first and take out the element from the front point. Consider, suppose we have added one more element, say 13 in the rare pointer. So there are three elements in Q now. And now we are performing an operation, a delete. So delete, uh, we have initialized the front pointer as minus one. So we need to increment this front pointer first. So it will become a zero and then take out the element and store that in some variable so that it can be accessed. So A is equal to Q of delete. This will perform the delete operation. Next operation is get front operation. Get front operation returns the element at the front but unlike the delete operation, this does not update the value of a front. It only returns the front pointer, but it does not delete or it does not increment that front pointer. So again, we have to check whether the queue is empty. If the queue is empty, it means there is no element at the front. Otherwise, return the Otherwise, increment the front pointer by one and return that pointer. Is empty? Is empty? This operation checks whether the queue is empty or not. This is confirmed by comparing the value of a front and rare. If the front is equal to is equal to rare, then is empty returns true, else it returns the false. Consider, suppose we have inserted four elements, we have deleted three elements from it. So front is pointing to the location two and rare is pointing to a location three. If a delete operation is performed at this point, then we will increment the front pointer. After delete operation, the front and rare both will be pointing to the same element. So front value is three, rare value is also three. Or consider when we initialize the linked list, both front and rare we have initialized to minus one. It means if the front is equal to is equal to rare, the condition, if the condition is front is equal to is equal to rare, it means that the queue is empty. So same code will write in a function, if the front is equal to is equal to rare, then return one, otherwise return zero. Returning a one, it means the queue is empty. So this is how a queue can be implemented very easily. Applications of a queue. A queue can be used anywhere where we need the first in, first out principle. Queues are used in round, round robin scheduling in a processor. While processing any input output, the queue can be used. And queuing of a packets for the delivery in a network. So, there are different applications of a queue, but wherever we require first in, first out principle, we use queue. And wherever we require the operation, uh, require the operation first, last in, first out, we use stack. So student, in this course, we have seen what is linear data structure? What are the different types of data structure? What is data structure? And we have seen 
array, multidimensional array, stack, queue, linked list. All these are the linear data structure. So I hope all of you have got the idea about all the linear data structures. If you like this course or whatever is your feedback, don't forget to share your comment and feedback with us. Thank you.